So hey everybody, I am over in the Woodcrest community campus today. Um, this is actually the community where I grew up, so I'm like really excited to be back. And you can see the kids are, I guess they're having recess out there. Just like reminds me of my childhood, it's so cool. Um, they have to wear a mask in the classroom, but it looks like they don't have to for recess, which is really nice. Cause it's kind of hard to run around with a mask on. Okay. so. I'm going to be answering some questions today because I've been getting tons. So I'm trying to keep on top of them. So sorry if I don't get to yours, like don't take it personal. <laughs> okay. So the first one is, I'm really happy to be getting back to answering these questions now. Um, the battery in my camera died and I had to go feed Xander. So life is busy, but I'm really happy to be getting back to these now. So the first question is, how is the community dealing with the pandemic? Um, probably just like everybody else. Um, and we're basically just hoping and praying that we get through it and that we get to the other side. But back in March, when New York State closed down, our communities did as well. And we went from being able to get together for meals and meetings a couple times a day to everyone being at home and every everything being at home, I should say. Um, we met over the phone, like conference calls, had um, worship meetings like that. Um, but the one great thing during quarantine was because we all live close to each other, like a small village, um, we could walk out and at least see each other and like wave. <laughs> um, so for example, my grandparents lived here and Branson and I could go visit with them at a distance um, because they got kind of lonely by themselves. But now that the restrictions are somewhat lifted, um, we are able to do a bit more together. But of course, we're still being careful. Um, the kids wear masks in school and so forth. Um, I don't want to say um anymore because somebody in my comments commented that I say um too much. So I'm, I'm going to work on not saying um. It's a bad habit that I got into. <laughs> there is no question of going back to normal. Um, <laughs> I'm so bad, okay. I think there's no question of going back to normal though, if you mean by that doing what we did before the pandemic. I hope it's changed us and made us more aware of one another and what community is all about. It's not about following a bunch of traditions or doing things a certain way, although I do think traditions can be beautiful. So the next question is, hi Laura. I would like to know, can slash do people from the Bruderhof entertain friendships with outsiders, maybe even folks who aren't Christian? Yes, we can and do. I have many friends who don't live on the Bruderhof. They visit me and I visit them, um, hoping for more visits once this COVID program is over. Um, my grandfather is someone who can make friends with pretty much anyone he meets. He loves going out into the neighborhood and just talking to people. He also does a ton of letter writing or he'll just sit in his armchair and call one person after the other um, that he's met just to check in. Like he even has a book or about 10 little books, um, address books, where he writes down his contact information um, from people he meets and he'll still be calling them decades later to make sure they're doing okay, which I think is really beautiful, really awesome. Um, my dad is kind of the same way and growing up, we always had people coming to dinner um, or to breakfast who weren't from the Hof. My dad likes to have spirited conversations with people about everything from the economy to technology to politics. So we learned a lot as we sat around the table eating our barbecue chicken or scrambled eggs. And on the breakfast thing, if somebody was visiting the Bruderhof, he and my mom would invite them to breakfast, like I said before, and then we'd be encouraged to participate and ask questions and tell about what we were doing. And he'd always be like, kids, now it's your chance to learn someone, something from someone else, which was really good for me. I learned a lot and trying to bring some of that into my own little family. So thanks, Dad. <laughs> okay, so next question. Can you talk about how you decided to take your vows, please? Well, I'd grown up in the Bruderhof, so I pretty much knew what it was all about. And just seeing how my parents lived and how they believed um, so that had a big influence on me. It was just so genuine for them. There was no pretense and they believed what they read in the Bible and tried to act on it in their daily life. So in a way, it was a no-brainer for me. Um, some people might call that brainwashing, 
but I think that's nonsense. If you look at how early Christianity was spread, the bulk of it was by uh, procreation and formation. Um, the kids in early Christian households were exposed to practical invisible practices, which was what brought about their own conversions. And I think this is actually something that's neglected in modern evangelicism, where folks are more concerned about reaching people they've never met, and then they forget the people in their own households. So anyways, back to the question. I was on a trip to Paraguay visiting the sites of former Bruderhofs there. Um, it was actually the Bruderhof where my grandmother grew up. And we were in the cemetery. Um, we refer to them as burial grounds here. Um, and that is actually where my grandmother's younger sister is buried. And just seeing the rows and graves of people who'd been so committed to following Jesus and gave their entire lives for that really did something to my heart. And I knew then that I had to do the same. I can remember the exact moment and I often think back to it. Um, shortly after that, I asked to become a member of the Bruderhof and was accepted and took my vows. So that's just a short story of how it all happened. That's it for today. So I'll see you next time and keep asking and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already.